Hey, Austin. How you doing, buddy? Good, Dad. How are you today? I'm doing great. We've got some uh, special guests today, my son, special guest. Yep. Today, we're going to take a, a look inside the heart and mind and relationship of our first father and son guest in their spiritual journey as players and coaches. Since our first encounter as teammates with the New Orleans Saints in 1987, we've shared and participated in a lifelong relationship and friendship. Our backgrounds would suggest that we had nothing in common. He was from Tennessee and I was from Pittsburgh, but our hearts and minds would align in a special way. We've been guests in each other's homes. We've enjoyed many eventful meals together. We shared the sidelines in three different coaching stops from Dusseldorf, Germany, to Lynchburg, Virginia, and Decatur, Mississippi. And along the way, Miss Pauline even taught our second guest how to swim. At first glance, it's easy to see that both of our guests had tremendous success as college and professional players. As coaches, well, they've combined for six world championships in three different leagues. But today, they've agreed to share their story with you and I. My name is Ken Karcher, and I'll be your host. Alongside me is my son, Austin Karcher, the co-host. And Austin and I would like to welcome Mike and Chandler Jones to Awaken Kingdom Culture, where hearts and minds come alive, one story at a time. Welcome, Mike Chandler. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you, uh, Karcher and uh, Austin, for having us. Well, we're excited. Coming. This is going to be a, a great time together and looking forward to hearing your story and having a couple laughs as well. Well, Mike, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to kick it off with you, and uh, if you'd be kind enough just to uh, start by giving us one word that would describe the Jones home that you grew up in. Wow. Wow, that's kind of hard to say, Carter, but the one thing I would probably use is uh work ethic. Wonderful. Let let's talk Mike a little bit about your family. T tell tell us as listeners, you know, mom, dad, siblings, just give us a little bit about that and and even tie in growing up in Chattanooga in the 60s and 70s. Well, first let's start off with uh my dad, James Jones as well as my mother, Gladys Jones. And obviously, uh, they are from uh, Pulaski, Tennessee, and moved to Chattanooga before I was born. So uh, both places have a special place in my heart. Uh, one is so far in the country, you wouldn't know where you're going in Tennessee. <laughs> but um, the other one, Chattanooga, is much um, more developed. Uh, much more of a welcoming spot for visitors. And so um, I have a lot of things uh, that I've seen growing up. And I would say the first one would be um, understanding that I had to walk to Sunday school uh, or church uh, when I was young. So that was probably the biggest one. I mean, here, here we got a car and I'm walking to church. So <laughs> gave you an opportunity to think about um, you as a person and why I'm going to church. And so uh, I thought that was unique, uh, walking to church uh, through rain, sleet, snow, and sunshine. That's dedication there, Mike, that's for sure. Tell us about your, your siblings. Well, actually, I have a brother by the name of James, who's the oldest, then I'm the second oldest, and then I have my sister Renee, and then my uh, sister Ross. Old Roz. We loved Roz. She's something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I know Miss Pauline loved Roz. She had that hearty laugh. She was great. <laughs> Still um, does. So, Chandler, in uh, one word, how would you describe your dad? Oh, uh, I would say, <laughs> I, would, I would say one word I give my dad is discipline. My dad was, was, regimented as he could be uh and he knew like you know goals were set and what to what to try to attain and it was like he was on schedule to, to do what it took to make sure that those things happened so um that's what i would say discipline discipline very good i like that mm -hmm. um how how did your dad inspire and influence your faith oh yeah so 
Um, did did I mean, you have to walk to uh, to church in Sunday school? <laughs> no. Can I say no. this? Can I say this? <laughs> he step on the way to church. <laughs> and, uh, one thing, one thing that was always good, you know, living with my dad. My dad was gonna drive. He was gonna make that drive. So uh, <laughs> the walk, the walking days were were few and far between from uh, from his early childhood. Um, but now, nah, when it came to to you know going to church with my dad, that was that was some special. Um, you know, growing up half half of my years with my mom and living with my dad. Um, me and my mom, I, we grew up Catholic. I went to a Catholic school, Catholic high school, Catholic elementary school, middle school. So, um, and just in terms of the uh, church experience, is so much different, right? Um, the Catholic, Catholic school is so uh, kind of like traditional by the book that way. Um, and going with my dad was a little bit different. It was different energy in there, uh, just a whole different experience. And also just with my mom, you know, we didn't necessarily go as often and go as much um when i was living with her so that when i got a chance to live with my dad it was hey on sunday this is what we're doing you know <laughs> i would say we, this is what we're doing so that, 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 that was that was gonna happen you know there wasn't there wasn't any missing it you know I, i'm waking up on on a on a saturday coming from a game on friday i'm hurting ankles hurting everything's hurting and my dad's like oh we still gonna make it happen on sunday so you're gonna find a way to get up but uh, <laughs> but, yeah, that disciplinarian so. right chandler disciplinarian uh, definitely. definitely so so that was that, uh, and that's how I would describe it. Awesome. What about uh, your dad? How do you inspire inspire your faith? Yeah, I mean, just for me, kind of just seeing seeing how it gave him direction, gave him purpose. Um, it definitely has kind of pushed me in that way. Uh, try to find that within myself and find that uh, just as I move throughout life. Um, so you said, you said a key thing there, you said a key thing, find it yourself. You know, that's what I try to encourage people. You got to own what you believe yourself. It can't be what mom and dad or someone on television said, or even like today, you know, the things we're going to talk about, I surely hope someone just doesn't believe it because the four of us are saying it. I hope they own it from themselves. So Jonesy, what, what about you, Jonesy? Who are some of the role models for you in the faith as you were growing up? Who are your role models? Well, obviously, I would say my dad, because that was the first thing that he talked about every morning was God. So uh, it had a big impact on me as far as knowing uh, who I am, not in the world, but in Christ. So Mm. uh, when you go back and look at it, I don't have to say it's my dad, because without a question, he pushed me to church every Sunday, that's for sure. But uh, it, it just gave you an opportunity to um, think of things as you walk to church, uh, why am I doing it and who am I doing it for? And so those things to me were big because it gave me an opportunity to not only see it, but uh, really walk it, walk out that faith. Yeah. Well, um, so obviously Chandler, I've heard quite a bit or a lot of stories about your dad as a player. You know, yeah. obviously, um, I've heard that he was a, a big time player and, and has done a lot of great things as a player. So um, do you have a favorite story about from your dad's playing career? Maybe something he told you about or an old video or or anything that you can uh, uh, you remember growing up and, and, you know, being really proud of yeah. that 16 millimeter video. <laughs> <channel. Yeah. laughs> Because, you know, when my dad was playing ball, all this was happening, you know, before I was born. So I didn't get a chance to experience it uh, like as a young child being on the field. Like, as you know, when you see kids nowadays growing up with their parents in sports, you kind of see like the Steph Curry's, his his kids out there on the court with them, you know, uh, seeing Patrick Mahomes, his kids out there on the field with him. I didn't get a chance to experience that part of it because my dad's career was done before then. Um, yeah. But for me, you know, I just kind of will come across old clips or old things that I see with my dad and I'll send it to him. Of course, and a lot of times it's in black and white or, you know, it's real foxy, <laughs> so it's hard to see. So I can't, I can't even truly decipher if that's really him, you know? He says it is. But, uh, no, nah, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's always been pretty cool just, you know, seeing old tapes or seeing old things. Um, when I was in, uh, when I was in Green Bay, uh, I had, you know, a bunch of the video guys, they kind of had known that my dad played and, um, was able to find some like super super old footage uh, from 
from back when he was when he was playing. So I had sent some clips to him, and you know we would joke about it. There was a, there was one drive that I remember in particular. Uh, it was a couple couple. He caught a pass early, made a guy miss. Then another play, he he got a pass to him and got lit up. And I was like, Oof. Oh, oh, this is this is what was going on back then, huh? This isn't the story you told me. No, but uh, <laughs> did you catch him loafing at all in any of those clips? Uh, didn't see any loafs. Uh, I wish I did. <laughs> Wish I did, but uh, <laughs> yeah, he graded out pretty well. I'll tell him that. <laughs> I, I want to show this. Um, he was the first one sent it to me. I didn't even realize it. I don't know if you can see that or not. Oh, um, yeah. Was, uh, he sent me that. That was back with the Vikings, and obviously um, it was a McDonald's card at that time. <laughs> really? That you have now, so you know it was by <laughs> McDonald's. And so he sent it to me, and that was the first time he ever seen it, and I just said, wow. So that just tells you how far that goes back. Uh, I didn't know awesome. McDonald's had cards. That's the first I ever heard of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, um, so Chandler, um, obviously my dad referenced this in the beginning, and this obviously comes from my mom. But yeah, uh, do you recall learning how to swim in Lynchburg, or, or is this a lie that my mom's just making up? <laughs> Well, hey, Austin, I'll tell you this. There's been uh, many of uh, places I've tried to learn how to swim. Um, <laughs> so I can't, I can't necessarily quite recall, but I will say this. Uh, there was an opportunity where I tried to learn growing up back in L.A. Didn't happen. Uh, there's another, <laughs> another opportunity um, in, in Louisiana with some family out there. Didn't happen. Um, and then when, I remember when, when I was in Virginia with you guys, I, I might have learned how to swim a little bit then. Came back home. All I could do is doggy paddle. So, <laughs> you know, my career in swimming has been like this. It's been a lot of down moments, not a lot of ups. So, uh, so, so yeah. Well, well, when I was playing at Eastern Michigan on Sundays, we would go in after games and we would get in the pool and do like a pool workout and stuff like that. And uh, you know. You know, there were there would always towards the end they'd say, okay, anyone who can really swim, go for you know, do laps or whatever. And uh, you know, I didn't do much swimming myself, so I, I don't know how much he actually did teach you because I, <laughs> I stayed at the end and just uh, with a few of my other pl uh, teammates and yeah. and didn't swim too much. So, uh, <laughs> jo Jonesy, in the same way we mentioned your faith. And who influenced you there? Who would you say were the earliest people that influenced or inspired you to love sports? Wow, man, that, that's going way back. Uh, obviously, Alvin Jones um, really started my athletic uh, career uh, in the bars club. And so uh, going back to that point, Alvin Jones was the head coach. And uh, back then, bars club had maybe 12 different teams because uh, you had so many uh, young kids going there at that time. And so he really started me off. Uh, didn't ha didn't understand catching, so all he did was run in the rounds with me. So uh, that's how I, how it all started with Alvin Jones. Alvin Jones, is he still alive today, Mike? Do you ever I'm speak to him? I'm not sure. I am not for sure. Uh, I think the last time I had talked to him has been 15 years ago. So I am not for sure if he's still around. Wow. Thanks to Alvin Jones. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, Chandler, describe your life as a kid growing up. You know, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So, you know, growing up, my mom, she uh, she's from New Orleans. Um, I was kind of born and raised in L.A. Uh, and then my with my dad, my dad's moved around so much with football, uh, just being wherever he was. So my mom, you know, made sure of it that I was going to go stay with my dad on Christmas birth vacations, summer vacations. Um, and really, for me, uh, sports kind of was my was everything for me. So I grew up playing all the sports, football, basketball, baseball, running track, play some soccer, um, a little bit of everything. And I always knew that like during those summer months or Christmas vacation, I was gonna be able to go see, see my pop. So I did a lot of traveling. I was fortunate enough at a young age to be able to go, you know, all over, whether that was Florida, Tennessee, Germany, um, you name it, I was going everywhere. 
uh, wherever either sports took me or wherever my dad was taking me, wherever he was going, or wherever I was going with my mom, whether we was going on family vacations and stuff. So uh, I was able to travel quite a bit. So I was fortunate in that, res- in, you know, in that aspect. Um, but I mean, for me, I just, as long as I was doing something active, I was happy. Uh, I, I was an active yeah. kid. I loved to run around and loved to play tag or whatever it was outside. You know, I grew up outside playing tag and playing sports in the neighborhood. And then whether you got me on the field or whatever sport it was, I just run around over there. So um, it was going to be a lot of that. And my dad would joke around a lot about it, but I slept a lot too. So it was either I was active running around or I was sleeping. Uh, that was pretty much, <laughs> that was pretty much what my childhood consisted of. Awesome. Well, you know, obviously, or for the listeners who don't know, I mean, you know, when my dad was at Liberty, Coach Jones came and, and coached with my dad there. And, um, you know, he's living in the basement, in our basement, I believe. Is that right, Dad? Yes, sir. And, and Chandler came for one summer, and that's how, you know, I met Chandler. And, you know, I can remember going up to the field every day and playing with Chandler and a bunch of our other friends. And it was just a good time. So, you know, I was definitely blessed to to have you come and, and be around us. And, you know, I'm thankful for those times. Oh, yeah. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, obviously, you know, your parents were separated. What were some of the biggest challenges maybe besides traveling that, uh, presented itself from, you know, just not always being around your, your dad or not always being around your mom at the same time? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the kind of the, the biggest thing, I, luckily, you know, during that time, technology started to evolve, you know, I, I could talk to my mom on the phone, talk to my dad on the phone. Um, so that was good. We didn't have FaceTime or anything at that time. So, it, you know, I wasn't able to FaceTime and do all that. But, uh, I mean, just, you know, with football and now, especially now that I've gotten into coaching and gotten older, um, realizing the demands of coaching, what it, what it takes. Uh, so a lot of times just not, you know, always being able to be there with my dad was something that um, – I think when I was young, I didn't really understand or grasp that concept. I knew like yeah. I go spend the summer out there, I go go spring winter break out there, but I didn't really understand the uh, like the demands of what coaching you know took on on you as a coach, and then what it takes on your family as well. Like fortunately, you know, I had my mom and I did everything with her, um, but also just kind of being able to have my dad for those periods were always special. Um, and I understood when I had those times, like I was cherishing cherishing those times as well uh even you know when i you know when he was in germany and coaching trying to win a, a world championship there i'm out there running around you know having fun within the building i'm out there at the soccer camps out there so i got a chance to see all of that and do, do all sorts of stuff the only english speaker at this the german soccer camp but it was a great time um uh, so, well, so yeah. you, you know to, oh go ahead go ahead, ahead. Oh, go ahead austin go ahead uh, what? Because um, I have very fond memory and memories of Dusseldorf. Because I mean, I mean, those were some of the best times of my life. You know, when did when was the first time you went over to Europe? Was it when he was at Frankfurt, or um, and, and then what were kind of some of those memories then? Yeah. So uh, I have I have a few that like always stick out whenever I think about this. So for me, it was uh, it was Dusseldorf was when I my first my first experience out there. I don't think. I don't think I got a chance to go to Frankfurt when he was uh, coaching with, with the Galaxy. I think it was always with Ryan Fire. But um, yeah. when I, I remember in Dusseldorf, this one one thing in particular, I had gone to the soccer camp, uh, and my uh, and of course, you know, the time difference, right? So my mom's all the way in the West Coast in California. My dad, me and my dad are all <laughs> the way in Germany. Um, and so we had we had our soccer camp, and I think we were doing a vacation, or we were doing a, um, what do they call it, a field trip that day. So we were going to go see a movie. And typically, like, we always were let out at a certain time whenever, like, each day. But for whatever reason, when we were going to the movie, we were either coming back way later or coming back way earlier, one of the two. And I think my, <laughs> my dad came to try to come pick me up, and nobody was nobody was at the soccer complex at all. Nobody was there. <laughs> so then my dad's panicking because he's in Germany. But he's calling call, call, call my mom. My mom thinks that they lost me out here in Germany. And uh, <laughs> so my mom is, like, trying to – Trying to figure out some flights. She's looking at the, the first flight that she could try to take to get all the way out from LA to Germany so they come find their lost son. Uh, and, then, and then eventually we ended up coming back a little bit later uh, with this with the with the camp. And then, you know, after that, my dad was able to settle my mom. They was both able to settle down and understand that, okay, hey, he was on a field trip. He's back safe and sound. Don't we don't have to worry. 
But I just remember that always being something that I always laugh about. Um, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> They're panicked and you're having a great time. Uh, I, was, I was having a blast. I'm at this camp having a great time. I'm learning a little bit of German. I'm playing soccer. Uh, and they're they're both just running, going crazy, trying to figure out where the heck their son is. So uh, <laughs> I would have loved to hear Jonesy on the phone explaining that one. Oh, I think I lost Chandler. <laughs> yeah, I, I know Miss Simone. Uh, that wouldn't have went over very well. Uh, so so Jonesy, you know, we we asked Chandler. Now let's let's flip it to you as a dad. What were some of the challenges that in your heart and in your mind you had living apart from Chandler? And, uh, you know, was your heart in two places at times? Well, let me go back and say this, Karcher. Uh, obviously, um, as we grow and develop in Christ, we do get off track. And um, I think that was one of the areas that uh, split us apart. Um, sometime in my own doings opposed to her doing. So um, life takes us in different directions. Um, we make choices every day. And so uh, that part of it was tough. Um, but I do say this, obviously, when you do have a child and you're separated, um, that that's probably the hardest part because you don't, get that development day to day, not mm. uh, during the winter or summer or whatever, but just day to day, because I think growth is so important. And, and the mind, developing the mind and the heart is uh, such a key as well. So those things there were tough on me, even though I still had a job to do. So okay. um, when you go back and you look at those things, was it tough? Yes. Uh, it wasn't easy. And so therefore, uh, any time that I have to spend with Chandler, that was the biggest and most important thing for me at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing that uh, I say to do help pass along uh, some of the sorrow is the memories that you do have of the, the previous time you were together. For instance, uh, with Chandler, when he came to Chattanooga, I was taking golfing all the time, and I don't know, maybe five, seven years old, somewhere in there. And uh, it's so funny because we'd get a golf cart, but he would hit the ball and take off running down the fairway to the ball. So <laughs> we, we really didn't use the golf cart, uh, so to speak. But I, I, those are things that I remember um, as, as when he was young and growing up. It is just the enthusiasm of being out in the open air and doing what he wants to do. Yeah. Wow, those are great memories, and you you really answered the last question we had for you. That that's awesome. As we transition to the second quarter, guys, let's talk a little bit about playing career. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll start with Mike and and Jonesy. Tell tell our listeners um, what some of your best high school memories might be, and the sports that you played in high school. Wow, uh, I went to Riverside High School. Uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, obviously the high school that I went to, and I bag up, I went to East Fifth Street Middle School. And at the middle school, I played all four sports, uh, football, basketball, baseball, and ran track. And we won the championship in every one of those sports <laughs> back in middle school. And I'm not just talking about my um, – Last year there, I'm talking about every year that I was there. That's just how good we were there. I think wow. in basketball, we only had like seven players. But uh, five, the, the first starters uh, scored 20 points a game or better. So uh, when I go back and look at the high school part of it, um, played four sports. Uh, but basketball and football was really my main sport. Uh, even though we only won one game a year in uh, in football. So uh, <laughs> football was still an exciting sport to me. But basketball, uh, we played in the championship game every year. So uh, that part of it was exciting because we was traveling uh, quite a bit. Uh, just so happened just to uh, – we had my head coach in college, his daughter – uh, taught chemistry in our high school. So and that's how I ended up going to Tennessee State uh, University is through uh, his daughter telling her her dad 
you got to come see this player here. So uh, long story short, um, I chose Tennessee State because they did throw the football. So uh, that, was, that was a big part of me going to Tennessee State. They threw the football. Obviously, when I left um, high school, going into college, and I just used this short part here, going into college, um, I remember taking one trunk, and uh, that was it. <laughs> Everything was packed in that one truck. <laughs> and so, uh, travel lightly, right? Travel lightly. Yeah, travel lightly, brother. Travel lightly. So uh, that was my biggest memory of uh, Tennessee State. I mean, obviously, I did some good things there, but uh, just to say, even playing at Tennessee State. Um, my senior year, I think we had nine guys drafted from that team. And yeah, you had some great teams, didn't you? Yes, yes, we really did. And uh, Mike, what did you take from Coach? It was Coach Merritt. Was he the coach? I think John Merritt. John Merritt. What, what did uh, What did Coach Merritt give you in your four years there that you've taken with you even to now? Well, I, I would I would have to go back and say this: John Merritt was one of those head coaches. Um, he only showed up to practice on Monday and Friday uh, because he was out bringing in money. But uh, he had two of great assistant coaches, and I say coordinators, and Joe Gillum and uh, Alvin Coleman. And those were the guys that really taught you uh, because John Merritt trusted in those guys. And uh, I remember my freshman year in the first meeting and uh, – Coach Coleman, we call him Dean Coleman, because Dean, he was the dean of biology. And back wow. then, your coaches had to teach. And so he was the dean of biology, not just a, <laughs> a biology professor. He's the dean. And so that's why we call him Dean Coleman. And um, I just remember sitting down, and uh, and I'd bag up. He, he let us walk in the room, and it was dark. And so uh, everybody found the seat, and uh, he, he said, there's a matches, a book of matches on your desk. Pull out a match and light it. And everybody lit the match. And he said, now all of you can see. He said, at first when you walked in, you walked in the darkness. And he says, truly, if you want to have sight, you got to have light. So mm. that part right mm. there just blew my mind. And uh, he gave us a spare ring notebook. And he says, I will not give you a playbook. You would have to write your playbook. And so mm -hmm. from that point forward, I understood that um, I had to study this game, not just play it. And so mm -hmm. that's the lesson that I probably learned out of any of that uh, is what he did that first meeting with us. Great words. Great words. Yeah. Um, Chandler, before we get into your high school and, and your college experience, what influence did your dad's career have on you wanting to play in the first place? Yeah, uh, man, I would say, I think the, I think like the love that I had for football was almost like genetic. I feel like that was, that was like when I came out of the womb, I feel like football was just already like what I wanted to do. But I think yeah. just being, uh, being around my dad, being around, uh, just, the game uh, and just seeing him put so much time into it and him being so passionate about it. I think that like sparked another interest for me and made me like push and dig a little bit deeper um, and, and within the game. So, uh, I mean, I think that's what it really comes down to. Like my, my dad loved it. And I, and I just knew uh, just like seeing him put that time in and seeing him chase after championships and do all that. Like I, I could see the, the, you know, the finished product when he had success and was able to be successful. Like, okay, if you really put the time in and you really do this the right way, you can have success as well. So I think um, at a young age, I just was able to, to see that and get, get my hands on it and kind of be around it. And I think that just helped motivate me and push me to, to really enjoy the sport and love the sport. And, um, and I, I would say really that was it. Awesome. Uh, I'm very similar as well. You know, my dad's passion really just definitely passed on to me as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so tell us a little bit about your high school career and, you know, where, where you played and uh, tell then tell us uh, where you went to college and why you chose that college. Yep. 
Uh, so I went to Bishop Montgomery High School in Torrance, California. Uh, it was a private school. We're really known, that school is really known for basketball. It wasn't really a huge football school. Still to this day, isn't really big in, on football. Um, but, I, you know, going there, I had a couple buddies of mine that I grew up with who were going there to play basketball. Uh, and all mom knew it was a really good school academically. And uh, she was like, hey, we're going, this is where we're going. I have played Pop Warner at a couple of, like at a school in El Segundo and um, did some things in that area. So, like, we were trying to get all the kids that we play with to come to high school and play on the same team together. We weren't able to get, uh, like, the zoning for the public school system there to be able to go to all, go to the same school. Um, so after that, my mom was like, are right, we going to find the best school for you academically to go to? And you'll go play play football there and enjoy it, you know. So I went to Bishop. Honestly, it was a great school. I loved my experience there. I played uh, football. I ran ran track. I played baseball. Um, tried to play basketball. Got cut from the freshman team, uh, you know. They, 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 it was like I said, it was a basketball school. It was competitive, yeah, I bet. They, 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 they were good. You, you and Michael Jordan, right? Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> it was one of the best things that happened to me was me get cut. So I was able to focus more on football and on baseball at the time. Um, but yeah, I went to went to Bishop. Uh, we didn't go to the playoffs any of the years I was there until my senior year. Um, we went to the playoffs for the first time, and I want to say it was like twenty five years. Um, wow. And then we, we were in a super competitive league, so we played against uh, Sarah, Junipero Sarah, which is Gardena Sarah, or Robert Woods, and a bunch of Marquise Lee, a bunch of guys came out of that school. Um, we played against another good school called Cathedral, where they had a bunch of other guys who ended up playing in the NFL, a couple other schools out there as well. They're really competitive, like Catholic school league um, in Los Angeles. But then um, after, after high school, I uh, didn't have any scholarship offers, didn't have any any opportunities to go um, play on scholarship anywhere. I uh, was going to go to a junior college back home, um, close, close to, the, to the house, it was called L.A. Harbor. I got a call last minute uh, from San Jose State that they wanted me to come walk on there. Uh, never at the time, never heard, heard of San Jose State, never heard, heard of San Jose, California, didn't know anything about it. Uh, my mom had a gut feeling about it, and she just felt like it was the right thing to do. So ended up ended up going and walking on to San Jose, packed my bags and was out there a couple of weeks after the phone call. Um, so I ended up walking on, redshirted my first year, didn't play. Uh, my next year as a redshirt freshman, I ended up starting. Um, at the training camp, we had a lot of injuries in the receiver room, so I ended up starting week one. Uh, we went to go play against University of Alabama um, and then started that game, which was crazy to come from like high school, playing in front of like 500 people, <laughs> So my first college game playing in front of 115,000 in Tuscaloosa was like mind blowing. Um, wow. But got got a chance to do that, so I, you know, started my redshirt freshman year, earned a scholarship after that season, um, and then finished out my career playing at San Jose State. And you know, uh, when I was able to leave there, uh, I was able to leave as the all-time leading receiver in school history. So um, broke a bunch of the records for receiving and for touchdowns and catches and yards and stuff. So. I was able to have a pretty good career at San Jose. So that's well, kind of I, I think, I, Austin, you have a couple of those stats, don't you? Well, well I was literally going to say them. I'm like, wow, <laughs> from a walk on to these stats. I mean, I, I have, uh, he was the Spartans career leader in number of receptions with 248, 31 touchdown receptions, only player in school history to catch at least 50 passes in a season, in all four seasons, and one. You know, he scored or 60 or more receptions in two different seasons. And then 2013, you were all Mountain West selection with 79 pass catches and 1,356 yards and 15 TDs. So, you know, you really uh, proved yeah. everyone wrong. That's oh, awesome. I, I can I can remember um, I was at Eastern Michigan and I, and I can remember turning on uh, the TV and I, I think I was a senior and maybe you were a sophomore or something like that. But. I can remember watching you playing and lighting it up. So that's yeah. awesome, Chandler. Yeah, I appreciate that's it. A, that's that's a, culture. Um, sure. It's amazing just listening to uh, the stats and all that good stuff. I, I think the one thing that I miss more than anything else is seeing him play in college. Mm -hmm. I never had yeah. a chance to see him play in college. Uh, but it, you better know I talked to him on the phone to see what was going on, <laughs> and how he was doing. And uh, Austin, you mentioned those records. Uh, I broke Elmo Wright 
record back in uh, career touchdowns for the NCAA with 55 uh, career touchdowns. And uh, Jerry Rice ended up breaking that record. But uh, you, you just go back and you just look at um, all the things that Chandler has accomplished uh, through the grace of God. And I, and I say the same for me as well, uh, because that, you just don't show up at the door and those things happen. Yeah. Well, well and the, the apple doesn't fall from the tree very far either. Well, that, that leads us to that, this question, okay, Chandler. Who, who's the better receiver? <laughs> so this is, this is what I'll tell you. This is what I'll tell you, you know. As, when I was at a young age, I, I can't remember where exactly this was. I don't remember if this is in Germany or if this is what we had. Uh, we're back in the States somewhere, but me and my dad had a foot race. We had a race. And uh, <laughs> I whooped him. I whooped him. So, uh, obviously <laughs> – the speed, you know, I was a speedy receiver. I had the speed. You know, he was a bigger bigger receiver. You know, Is that why he calls you Jeff Jones? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. He didn't necessarily have the juice like I did. So, um, so we were, you know, a little bit different different style. Uh, you know, I, I made a lot of guys miss. I don't, I don't think he can make anybody miss in the phone booth. Uh, so <laughs> Chandler, but, uh, maybe it's Jet Jones and Tank Jones, huh? <laughs> Yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. Um, but no, he I, must have eaten a couple of those cookies in Germany before you ran that race. <laughs> we're we're going to get to that a little bit. <laughs> well, we'll let you we'll let you two fight that out. But in all seriousness, I mean, anybody that's listening that has any football background, some of the things that both of you have done have been quite amazing. And we'll speak later about this. But you know, I think what's really been uh, special, at least to me, and, and having Jonesy as my friend, it's the type of people that you are. I mean, you were great players, but more importantly, you're great people. And I think that's what uh, will encourage our listeners as we continue to share your story. Let's bounce back to you, Jonesy. Yeah. I know some of this. I know Austin doesn't. Maybe Chandler knows a little bit. But let's talk draft day and that experience and your reaction when that phone rang and it was the Minnesota Vikings – Tell us what was going through your head. Well, I, I go back a little further than that. Um, the first day, obviously, of the draft, Pittsburgh called, and they said, we're going to take you in the second round. And the uh, second round passed by, and they didn't take me, so they took a receiver out of Kansas State, I think it was. And uh, I don't know if you know Larry Kersey, but Larry sure. Kersey coached that player at Kansas State. And uh, and I was sharing with him that they had taken that guy. And, but, you know, Pittsburgh had called me uh, before the second round and said, hey, we're going to take you. So I was happy. Didn't get taken. So uh, the second day I get taken by Minnesota Vikings uh, in the sixth round. And uh, obviously um, that's where my history started in the NFL. But uh, I, I do Did it ever snow there, Mike? Say that again? Did you ever get any snow up there? Yes, of course. <laughs> of tell us, tell us about Bud Grant, Jerry Burns. I mean, these are coaching icons that these young guys don't know. Those are your coaches, I think, and two veterans that I'm sure played a role in your development: Sammy White and Tommy Kramer. Yes, um, actually, uh, Bud Grant was a big time hunter. Uh, he hunted deer and he fished a lot. Uh, but here's the one thing I remember about Bud Grant. Uh, at that time, you were not allowed to wear long sleeve shirts when it's cold. And uh, I said, Coach, why are we not able to wear these long sleeve shirts? He said, We want to psych everybody out. I said, You already don't psych me out. <laughs> I mean, it's cold. <laughs> so um, I just remember Benny Ricardo, who was the kicker for us, and he said, Jonesy, uh, you want to stay warm? I said, Sure do. He said, get some red pepper and sprinkle it on your socks and put a cleaner's plastic bag over it. And he said, I guarantee you, your feet will stay warm. And it did. And uh, that probably helped me through those cold days in Minnesota. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, Bud didn't like, um, we had an indoor bubble. He didn't like going in there. He'd rather be outside on the field. The only time we did go in the bubble, if we had snow, 
uh, coming down that day and they couldn't clear the field. So that was his biggest pet peeve. We're going to be outside as long as we can. Uh, but Jared Burns was a good coordinator for us. I thought uh, – I, I just remember this one motion, stagger motion. So uh, it, that it, it's just certain things that catch your your ear, or your eyes, and that motion always caught my eyes. But uh, a very innovative guy, um, Burns was, and uh, Lord knows um, we miss him because he's passed away. Him and Bud Grant. But uh, those are two great guys that uh, started out in that professional career of mine that uh, I say wow to. And then also Les Steckles, who you probably know, Karcher. Yes. Um, Les was my receiver coach the first year. And uh, so I had a great time with him. Les come out of the service there. And so he was more of a drill sergeant to a to a degree and uh so it was just good times with him uh but he really taught you about the game and that's what that's the other part of it i thought was great about that part but uh that's where i got my name jonesy from from uh les steckles or squeaky miss M- M- squeaky i remember that yeah. M- miss pauline jonesy reminded me of a story let's see if you remember to tell it but she said ask mike about his first contract and his knowledge of taxes do you remember that story uh, well i remember the first contract and uh that contract was uh forty thousand dollars and, and i go back with mike lynn mike lynn is the general manager and so we draft joey browner in the first round and uh I won't tell what his signing bonus was, but his base was 50000 And so that meant that no other player could go above 50000 And so wow. Mike Lynn says to my agent, he said, he got two choices here. I can, uh, his base will be tw- uh, 40000 and we give him a $12,000 signing bonus, or we give him a $50,000 uh, base and a two thousand dollar signing bonus. When my agent say which one you want, I say ain't no food. That twelve thousand. <laughs> <laughs> that just goes back to show you, man, that uh, they're both the same. But really, uh, at the end of the day in the NFL, when you sign your name, that's the most money you're probably gonna get. <laughs> right, that's for sure. Talk about Mike uh, shifting gears a little bit here. Share with us that day you got the news that you were no longer going to be a part of the Vikings and they were going to trade you to the Saints. I remember you telling me a little bit about that. Share that with our listeners. What would, yeah. what that feel like? Well, I mean, obviously that's the first team I was with, Minnesota Vikings, and uh, so I felt heartbroken that <laughs> you know, being traded. And so uh, I literally cried uh, because I really wanted to stay with the Vikings, didn't know anything about the Saints. Uh, but actually, when I got there, I was happy I was because now I'm in warmer weather. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it really was a big shock um, being uh, traded. And, and I think I was traded for a running back. I can't remember his name uh, from the Saints. But uh, I was traded for him, in, in which we had some good receivers on that uh, receiving core that we had. Sammy White and uh, Sam McCullens, Terry LeCount, uh, Marty McDowell, uh, and Hassan Jones, A.C. Carter. Mm-hmm. So we had some good receivers uh, on that squad there. And so uh, Leo uh, Leo Lewis, uh, I don't want to forget Leo because Leo was a good receiver back at that point. So uh, we had some good receivers, and so uh, one of us was going to be expendable. And so it came down to me. And so, hey, that's how I ended up with the Saints. Well, Chandler, I don't know much of this you know or what your dad told you, but I'm going to give you my side of it, okay? Oh, boy. This is where our friendship started. You know, I became Karcher. (laughs) To this day, I'm Karcher. And he was Jones. Now, you're probably too young for this show, but I used to think of how we hit it off. There used to be an old show and it was Archie Bunker and George Jefferson. And they were best buddies. They had nothing in common when they started out. And there were some people who used to say, Jonesy and I were like Bunker and Jefferson. But, you know, we, we really 
in my mind, and I think in his, we d- started to develop what is now a lifelong friendship. And yes. when I when I got uh, my quick cup of coffee and got cut by the Saints because of your dad, he refused to catch my balls. <laughs> he, he caught Dave, Dave Wilson and Bobby Bears, but uh, mine, I got cut. And I promised him, I said, listen, someday I'm going to call you, Jonesy, about coaching. But the stories that I remember with your dad in, in that short period of time that built our friendship or was the start of our friendship – he used to love Houston's restaurant. Yeah. I don't know if he ever took you to Houston's, but we used to go down there and he'd eat and we'd have, uh, I, at least I did, I think he did too. We had a shake. They had great shakes. Yeah. So Miss Pauline and I were talking one night. We said, let's invite Jonesy and Simone over for dinner. And I think the first thing he said, we said, what do you have? And I said, I think we're going to make uh, grill some shish kebabs. He said, shish who? <laughs> so we knew that we knew that was out. And I started to figure out, well, maybe this guy's not going to eat a lot of things. So we end up having him over. I forget what we ended up making, but then we get the dessert. Here's your dad. You probably know what's coming. So we we sit down. Miss Pauline makes some brownies because he had told me he liked brownies. And he says, hey, do you have any vanilla ice cream? And we said, nah, we don't. We got chocolates. Oh, that, that's like medicine. I can't have that. <laughs> so he, he pulls out his uh, napkin. Takes the brownie, wraps it up, says, hey, can, can I take it home? Because I think I got some vanilla ice cream in my own refrigerator. <laughs> that was the start of our friendship right there. <laughs> so good, good memories. We started with a lot of laughs back then. And to this day, you know this, your dad still doesn't eat a lot of stuff. He's hard to please with the food now. He'll eat some shrimp, but that's about it. <laughs> He goes, he's a creature of habit. He'll find what he likes. He'll stick to it. That's right. Uh, Dad, wasn't there something about Fuddruckers? Doesn't he like their those burgers or something? Oh, he used to. He don't, he don't like burgers anymore. He used to love them. Right, Mike? Love, you don't eat them anymore. used to love them. You're right. You're exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, well, Chandler, okay. So, um, did you um, – talking about because i know you got a chance in the league um did you ever feel any pressure being the son of an nfl receiver and then you know as you got a chance did you ever feel like you had to live up to that yeah uh i i don't think there's ever like a thing about pressure for me i didn't i never really saw it as that um I, I, one thing that i feel like with the game of football uh i was always counted out so i was i feel like i was always on borrowed time like hey i'm I'm not supposed to be here. They don't think I'm supposed yeah. to be here. I'm enjoying the ride, you know? And I, I think um, with that, I, I just really appreciate where football took me. Um, I was able yeah. to see a lot of different places and able to kind of go far and wide with the game and, and meet a lot of different people and, and have a lot of fun with it. So I always, even when I, you know, got to NFL, I always saw it as like, this is fun. Like I'm playing the game I yeah. love. And, you know, at this point now, okay, I get paid for it, but still it's the game that I grew up loving and mm. the game that I, I've always been behind. So um, I think I, – I don't think there's really a sense of pressure uh, that yeah. – of like, oh, my dad did this, so I think I have to, you know, really, you know, excel and do great with it. Um, that that kind of didn't really feel like that, you know. And yeah. I don't think uh, – I don't think nobody even really ever heard of Mike Jones, so there was never uh, – <laughs> <laughs> no, but there was a, there, there was never that. No, uh, but <laughs> but no, no, I think uh, I I just really enjoyed it. I didn't really feel that pressure. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll tell our listeners a little bit about where you got an opportunity. I know you got to a couple camps, or I mean, yeah. tell us a little bit uh, about your opportunities in the pros. Yep. So I uh, I went undrafted to the Cleveland Browns. Um, I took a a visit there, uh, like during the pre-draft process, I took a visit to the Browns and to the Colts. Um, excuse me, the Browns and the, and the Bucks. And um, the receiver coach in Tampa Bay really, really liked me. Uh, and they had drafted like three receivers. And uh, he had gave me a call like, hey, you know, don't worry about the guys that we drafted. I still want to really want to come get you over here. And I'm like, all right. Yeah, you guys took three <laughs> receivers. Like, I'm not – I'm also not an idiot. But I was like, all right. Uh, so – it, Cleveland ended up not taking any receivers in the in the draft, um, and then the receiver coach I was there was Mike McDaniel, who's the head coach for the uh, oh, Dolphins yeah. right now. So, yeah. um, so I, I was there at the time with Shanahan and those guys. Uh, and I got to learn a lot of good things from him, and got a chance. He just was a quirky dude, so I got I really liked him, and got a chance to get to know him a, a little bit. So, um, so yeah, I spent some time there. 
Uh, and then after during training camp, I ended up uh, tearing my hamstring uh, pretty bad, which was – that was, I think, was a little bit of, like, a tough spot for me because I never really had dealt with injuries prior. Like, when I was in college, I was able to play through my career um, and didn't miss any games due to injuries. So, like, that was, like, the first time I felt like I dealt with that adversity, you know. Um, yeah. So I had to kind of get back healthy, uh, rehabbed after that, and then ended up getting a chance to – go sign with the Colts on practice squad. So I was there for uh, with, with Andrew Luck and a couple of those guys over there. Uh, T.Y. Hilton was, was playing really well at the time over there. Reggie Wayne was, was at the end of his career, but he was there at the time. Um, oh, cool. So I got a chance to kind of learn from some of those guys and spend some time there. Um, and then when I, you know, throughout the season, kept, kept going a little bit. They had a couple of injuries on defense. Uh, they wanted to bring in a guy – you know, to do some return stuff for them and, mm-hmm. and a bigger a bigger body receiver. Um, so they ended up letting me go, and I ended up going to Tampa Bay and finishing out my career in Tampa. So I was able to spend some time out there. Um, and then when that when that finished up, uh, the, the draft came back around the next year. They took – I want to say they took three receivers uh, mm-hmm. again. So they, they ended up messing up the first time, so they went back and did it again. But, uh, but then I ended up going and playing in Canada for a couple of years. So I got a chance to go play in Montreal for two years in the CFL. Um, and, and did that, and then once I finished up playing, I got into coaching. So, okay, how did you like playing the CFL? Uh, the it was a learning experience for me, right? So, like, yeah. learning and how to play with the waggle, uh, and and getting in the motion, and all that stuff was a little bit of it took a little bit of learning for me because I just wanted to hit the thing full speed and just go. But it's a little yeah. bit of a uh, little bit of nuance to it, and kind of just understanding how to you know, work leverage with that as well. So I had to kind of slow that part of my game down and, and learn that. But I, I really enjoyed it. I love I loved the city. The city was awesome. It was a great city. Uh, we weren't winning too many games at that time. Uh, so that part was a little tough. But, uh, but I mean, I met a lot of great guys that I, uh, <laughs> that I still, you know, like know to this day and still talk to to this day. And a couple of guys that I coached with uh, out there this last season, I played with them when we were when I was there. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh. Um, so that, let me, cool. as we move to the third quarter here in a second, let's finish up the second with a question. It's really to both of you. Mm-hmm. At this point in your careers as players, how would you describe, we can start with you, Jonesy, how would you describe your spiritual journey at this point in your life? Oh, obviously. As a, as a player. As a player? Uh, yeah, right at this point as a player. I would say it was a transition once again because – I think every day that you are blessed to be on this earth, you're learning, uh, learn about the word, learn about your spirit, uh, learn about who you are. And so therefore, I don't think that ever stops uh, or stopped in me, um, even though I may have been doing something I shouldn't have been doing. But those things are always uh, approaching me and in front of me. So that part of it spiritually um you know, you, you, you talk about holding yourself accountable, and uh, we all know that's tough because you need somebody to also hold you accountable. But um, that was probably the toughest part um, is being accountable for the things and the actions of Mike Jones. How about you, Chandler? Yeah, uh, I would say, you know, for me, I kind of was – playing ball and I was my whole focus at the time was like I gotta make this team and gotta you know make make the most out of my career um I think when I dealt with you know the adversity that I dealt with and had gotten hurt I think that's when a lot of that was tested um and I kind of leaned back on my upbringing and leaned back on you know the things that I learned from my my dad throughout the days and my mom throughout those days so I kind of had to sit back and reflect a little bit and I think during that time, it brought me closer to God and, and help, helped me uh, kind of like recenter and refocus a little bit um, because it was it was one of those things where, you know, at the time I had just been doing what I was doing and was doing it out of love. Um, but I realized, you know, it was also a reason why I, I, I'm here now to this day and where and at that time it was kind of like, a, OK, I'm here for a reason. And I had to kind of like refocus and recenter on that. So um, that's kind of where it, it kind of took me at that time. Appreciate your honesty. That's great. Thank you, Tanner. Well, as we transition to the third quarter, we're going to talk now coaching career. We're going to go from playing to coaching. As I mentioned in the intro, 
between the two of you, your six-time world champions, Mike, five-time world champion, assistant coach, head coach, a couple different leagues. Uh, what a feat. But I want to go back to 1998, Jonesy, because if you remember, uh, I held true to my word in 1987 when I said, I'm going to call you someday. And I'll never forget the call, Chandler. It was, like I said, 98. And I called up Jonesy and he picks the phone up and I say, hey, Jonesy, I got an opportunity for you. And like all coaches, he says, well, tell me about it. Where at? I said, Dusseldorf, Germany. He said, Dusseldorf who again? And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm coaching sixth grade girls hoops at the time. <laughs> Jonesy, what went through your mind on that phone call that evening? Well, you, you know, it's amazing about that because I think I expressed to you uh, back then in 1983, Minnesota Vikings and St. Louis Rams, I think it was at that time, was the first team that ever played in London, England. And so here it is, you calling in 98 and telling me, hey, I got a job here in Dusseldorf, Germany. I said, where? <laughs> Why am I going to Dusseldorf, Germany? <laughs> but, uh, I, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, I'm glad to uh, made the choice to go because obviously uh, you put me on the road of uh, coaching and um, winning some of these championships games. But uh I was coaching in high school, helping the high school team out, and I thought that's where I was supposed to be and not in Germany somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was a great experience. I remember I went to um, – I had to go interview with Galen in the airport in Orlando, and uh, he flew me in that morning, and he said a couple of words and said, okay, you got the job, and so I ended up coming back. And the next thing you know, uh, I'm down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, the first night, I'm going through the playbook with you. And, and the next thing you know, here I am coaching. That's awesome. Yeah. I know it was a blessing for me. That's for sure, my friend. Yes, it is. Yes. Chandler, how did you get your start into coaching? I think you started to reference this a little earlier. Yeah. I, uh, so when I'm, when I'm, contract ended in Montreal um, I think I kind of knew at the time that I wanted to make that transition um, I think my physically my body wasn't holding up anymore like my leg my hamstring still had been bothering me ever since the injury um, so I kind of knew all right I wanted to just kind of look for that next that next phase um, well at the time the head coach I was at San Jose State where I played college ball um, we had a new head coach my senior year so he still was there um, I had reached out to him when my season ended and let him know that I had interest and wanted to coach. Um, and he was, you know, perfect. He was like, man, I would love for you to come back here and, you know, GA with us. So um, I was kind of like having things lined up for that. Well, then at the end, of, when the season ended, you know, they ended up not finishing as good as, you know, they had hoped for. Uh, they ended up letting him go. So uh, mm -hmm. at the time I was like, all right, I got to kind of see what happens when movement's happening at San Jose. Um, or kind of figure the, this coaching thing out. Well, then the head coach that they ended up hiring was Brent Brennan, who was my uh, receiver coach uh, my redshirt freshman year. So he was oh, at Oregon nice. State. Um, and he was coaching there. He was a receiver coach there for some time um, and the recruiting coordinator. He ended up getting the head coaching job. So I reached back out to him and let him know what was happening. Um, and he was like, perfect. I want you to come back home, come back to San Jose. So ended up going back there and, and was a graduate assistant. Uh, they actually didn't have any openings on the offensive side of the ball, so I was working with the defense when I got there. So I was working under our defensive coordinator, Derek Odom, and working with the safeties. Uh, okay. So I got a chance to, to see it from the other side of the ball. And, I mean, right away for me it was a little bit of a challenge because it was like, all right, now I'm learning DB play and learning the defense, um, which, you know, going against them all these years, you kind of have an idea of, okay, coverages and, you know, this is what they're doing. This is how they're trying to attack you. This is how they're trying to, to stop you. Uh, but now it was like, all right, now I need to kind of get back into it. It's like the technical really side. Student, so. Yeah, the yeah. true student yeah. of the game. So I really had to learn that so I can go ahead and, you know, pass information to the defensive backs and kind of coach them up. So my perspective, I've always, you know, talked to the guys. has always been a little bit different because I'm always giving it to them from a receiver's vantage point. Like this is how they're trying to attack you and this is what they're trying to do to you. Um, so, you know, that was kind of how, how I jumped into it. Uh, I GA'd on the defensive side of the ball for three years, well, two, three seasons, two and a half years. Um, 
and then ended up graduating with my master's in counseling education. Um, and that was kind of how that all started coming back to San Jose, coming back home there and getting into it. So Chandler, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I'm going to tell you this story too. You know, now that your dad says he's coming to Germany and I think the obvious question that I'll throw at him, but, uh, I want to add to it a little bit is, you know, what was your, t- what's the toughest adjustment going to Europe to coach out of the, all of a sudden. So I had been there the year prior and I told him, I said, listen, here, here knowing his food issues, I said, <laughs> I thought for sure. I said, Mike, you're going to love it. Galen's great to work for. We're going to have a lot of fun. we got a good team, but I said, I just want to alert you. You're probably going to struggle with the food. So I said, here's what I'd recommend. Get one size smaller in your pants your waist size because you're probably not you're probably going to lose some weight well we go over there he gains weight and he's walking around in these pants that are like hip huggers you know he's standing on the sideline he can barely move it's like these things going to split at any moment my wife's like why'd you tell him to get i said the guy doesn't eat anything now he gains weight in europe makes no sense but it with in, in all that you know comic relief there i mean seriously jones you coach in high school d1 juco nfl europe cfl xfl usl fl now and the aafl which folded immediately yeah. and you and i've had some intimate talks it amazes me <laughs> that you've never had a chance to coach in the nfl oh yeah now, i know you'll never toot your own horn no. but in my mind i can't believe it no. so let me ask you a tough question and i know you'll be transparent have you ever struggled with being content, not getting that chance? Uh, Contentment, has that ever been I a mean, struggle? Obviously not, I am. But uh, I, I will say this, um, just looking at all the head coaches who were in NFL Europe, most of them went on the coach, whether it's a year or two or whatever, in the NFL. And uh, you look at um, Dick Curry, was it? If I'm not mistaken, Dick Curl, Dick Curl, Dick Curl, uh, Dick Curl. Frankfurt Galaxy, even uh, the coach that's the defensive coordinator with Kansas City was the head coach there. Yeah, I know. know he's the winningest coordinator in Super Bowl history. Yes, and so uh, you would have thought that that would have happened, but it did not. And so uh, those things happen in life. But do you do you sit back and? And, and wonder and get mad and all that stuff. No, we got to continue to move forward uh, because at the end of the day, it's not the position that coaches you, it's the passion that coaches you. So uh, mm. for me, uh, moving forward, not even being concerned about that, those things because uh, they're not in my control. They're not yeah. in my control. So uh, if they're not in my control, then I shouldn't be – pondering why not me so well i know this and i've done it every time i've been somewhere and i hopefully someone will hear this the, if i'm ever a head coach or when i've been a head coach chandler there's one guy i'm gonna hire the first guy I hire is mike jones i thank you i thank you well, I, I look for so, you to become a head coach again <laughs> <laughs> that's not happening i don't think <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Austin. Ask Chandler. You're going to ask Chandler. Yeah. So, uh, Chandler, what, what do you what have you loved about being uh, being a coach? Yeah, I think uh, one. I, I feel like I was able to learn a lot. Uh, you know, learn a lot of things from a lot of really good coaches. A lot of things from my dad. Um, so, I think for me, one of the things I love about it is being able to pour the knowledge that I have and give that to the guys that I've been coaching. Um, mm-hmm. I think you know it's selfish of me to go the rest of my life and not be able to pass on the information that I have to them. Um, so I think that's one of the things that I love about it is just being able to, you know, coach them up, whether it's playing receiver, whether it's playing defensive back, whether it's just a life, life experiences in general, um, just being able to, to be around the guys and be able to fellowship with them and just talk, talk ball with them. Uh, that's always been the thing that I love the most about it. Um, just being able to help them just be the best man, best version of themselves that they can be. Uh, it's been kind of like my passion and what I've loved the most about the game. So um, uh, that's what, you know, what I'd say I'm most passionate about. Awesome. Uh, so where all have you been since, uh, obviously, you went in GA'd. After yeah. GA'ing, where all have you been? Yeah, so I uh, 
So I finished GA in San Jose State, ended up going to uh, coach receivers at, at a small school in Idaho, so the College of Idaho, which is in Caldwell, uh, Idaho. Um, so that's about like 30, uh, 30 minutes west of Boise. Uh, so okay. I spent, spent about a year and a half there. So when I first got there it was during COVID. Um, so we had the COVID season and everything kind of happened. Everything shut down. It was, it was funny, me and the, another guy that I worked with, he was from Colorado. We just moved in together, just got our apartment. And then like a week later, everything shut down. <clears throat> so we had an empty apartment, was trying <laughs> to figure things out here in Idaho. Um, <clears throat> and of course, at the time, we didn't know how long, you know, how long everything was going to happen last for. So um, was just trying to figure all that out. But I spent spent about a year and a half there. Um, and then when I uh, was was at the end of my time there, I ended up getting an opportunity to go to uh, Green Bay as a, a scouting intern. Um, so okay. I, uh, I left um, left Idaho to go take on that opportunity, which kind of going into the scouting world is a little bit different. Like, you know, whenever I, when I got there, they were the big thing for them was like, hey, you got to make a decision. Do you want to coach or do you want to scout? Um, and, and I really at the time, I'm like, look, I just I love the game of football and I just I'm gonna find a way to be around it. If it's if I'm doing scouting for the rest of my life and I'm working on this side of the ball, I'm here for it. You know, I'm I'm gonna jump all in and do it. So uh, that that was kind of what I ended up doing. Um, was there uh, throughout training camp? Ended up coming back um, coming back home to LA after that. Uh, was kind of trying to figure out the next move. Um, ended up getting a chance to do the Bill Walsh uh, fellowship. Uh, with the Chiefs after that. So the uh, receiver coach that was there was my receiver coach uh, my senior year at San Jose State. Um, okay. So he was able to get me there on the fellowship. I did that um, during the, like, uh, tr- uh, not training camp, but during the uh, uh, OTA period. So I was there for that time. Um, after doing doing that, I ended up meeting a bunch of people in the scouting department, let them know about some of the things that I did in the scouting department in Green Bay. They ended up bringing me on as an intern there, so I did that for the next year. So I went back during training camp, um, and then I was back home, kind of working, doing some things with for them, so that you know, send, sending me reports, writing some things on guys while I was gone. Um, I was also, uh, you know, came back and helped out during the uh, the draft process and in the uh, in the combine. So I did some things with them, um, and then when my internship ended with them, had opportunity to go back to Montreal. Um, with uh, the defensive coordinator, Noel Thor- Thorpe, who he was my uh, defensive coordinator when I played in Montreal. So I um, mm-hmm. was able to, to get back there um, and get back into coaching. So then that's how I ended up back in Montreal coaching defensive backs. It's amazing how those connections, you know, happen as you cross paths with people. And that that's the thing I've said in every one of these podcasts, guys, that I'm amazed at how God works the tapestry of life. Mm-hmm. And we cross paths at certain times. Maybe then 10 years later, you meet that person again. And it's it's kind of overwhelming. Let me, Austin, just because for some time's sake, um, let me bounce here to the end of the third quarter. And I want to ask both uh, Mike and Chandler, you know, what role has your faith played now in your coaching career? Now that you're out of play and you're on the other side, talk to our listeners about how your faith has played a role in your coaching career. You want to go tell them you want me to go? Uh, I, I can kick it off because, I, as you said, I had something that kind of came fresh to mind. I think uh, for me, there was, you know, times where I was challenged because I think, you know, getting into this coaching thing, there's, sometimes you end up on some, you know, having an idle time just trying to figure out what your next move is or what's happening. And you never you never know when the opportunity is going to come or when, you know, when things are going to happen for you. Uh, but just kind of just staying, keeping your head down and just keep working. Like uh, that, that was kind of where – where I was and where I've been, it's just like, hey, it's going to figure itself out. Um, you just have to be ready when the time comes and when the, when the opportunity comes, you just got to be ready for it and be ready to attack it. So um, that's kind of, you know, where, I, where I've been, just kind of keeping my head down in that and just understanding, hey, you know, I, when that time comes, it's going to come, but I just have to just keep my faith and just keep going and moving forward. So um, that's kind of what, what came to mind as soon as you said that. Uh, awesome. Karcha, I would say this, um, it just about uh, talking about Dean Coleman, our offensive coordinator when I was at Tennessee State, and, you know, using the light and dark theory, uh, walking in the light. And uh, when I talk to players about walking in the light, uh, that, that, that's just, that is not just in football, but that's in your life as well. 
And I think that's the biggest part of it. Uh, really, I'm not here to coach you in football. I'm really coaching in life. Um, Amen. That's the, that's the part I think we forget as coaches because we're caught up in we got to do this, we got to do that. Yeah, we got a job, but uh, the ultimate job is helping them to walk in that light uh, and not in darkness. And I think that's that to me uh, speak more volumes than anything. You know, I send text to Chandler, uh, ask him how's he going today and things like that. But it's really talking about are you in the light? Uh, because if you're in the light, then that means you're growing as a Christian uh, and not suffering as a sinner. So, you know, Austin and I talk about it a lot, and I've shared it with many people that have crossed my path as well. You know, we focus so often as coaches and players on the do, yeah. and we forget the be. Yeah. And if we live out of who we be, it'll take care of what we do. Exactly right. You know, right. so yeah. well, let, let's go to the fourth quarter here. And uh, we're going to talk family now. Yes. And so, Mike, I'd like you just to share with our listeners a, a little bit about Miss Minerva, uh, the girls. You've already told us all about uh, Chandler, and they've had a chance to meet Chandler. But tell us about Minerva and the girls. And then here's the question. What was one of the challenges, Mike, you had of blending a family together? Oh, that's a good one. Um, obviously, Minerva is my wife, and um, she has twin girls as well as Stephen, uh, Manning, and Frankie. So that's five kids. And uh, but, but it was only three in the household when we started dating. And I, I would probably say the biggest thing was uh, before we got married, um, I said to Minerva, um, you know, I can't do this by myself. And she was saying, what you mean? Well, you got three kids here. And um, if I'm going to be a part of this, they're going to have a bedtime. Uh, they're going to do chores. And I said, and the reason why is because they need to understand that in order to be a family, you got to work together. And so that means you got to put your hand in when you don't want to put your hand in. And I think that's the biggest part of uh, the family part of it is teaching and as well as growing with the young people that you're around from day to day. So for that to happen, um, we need to change some things. And uh, Chandler is a witness to it because anytime he came in the summer, he had to watch the dishes <laughs> just like everybody else did. <laughs> yeah. And you had to cut that grass just like everybody else did. So um, it, it's it's uh, one of those things, and, and, and you go back in the Bible, and it talks about work. Work is a good thing. And so teaching young people how to work uh, obviously comes from the Bible, and it's just a way of doing it, how you do work when you are working. So uh, to me, mm. the blended family, uh, is it tough? Yeah, but uh, it's something that you take on and you have to do the best you can with it. Well said, well said. Uh, Chandler, how, how what are the challenges that you've had to work through when your dad remarried and then, you know, having other siblings as well? Yeah, I, yeah, so, you know, growing up, I, I felt like with my, me and my mom, I was always, you know, just the only child. So, like, I was always just, it was just me and my mom attacking things and doing things together. Um, you know, and I, I was, I try to look back to even when I was young with my mom, all I had to do was take the trash out. So I was like, I can take the trash out, take it out. <laughs> and, it, it and then I do, I remember all the time, like coming to visit my dad, it was like, all right, you got, you're going to be working. You're going to, you know, doing dishes. We, I remember there was a, a chore list and everything was labeled out and we all rotated, you know, wiping the table, sweeping, mopping, doing dishes. And I just remember, like, I was be like, man, I came back home. My mom was like, oh, yeah, you can do your dishes now. You can do this. You can do that. I'm like, oh, well, slow down here. Slow down. But, no, uh, but no, it, honestly, it, a lot of it kind of just taught me discipline, taught me, you know, a lot of different values that I, I appreciated. As I got older, I grew to appreciate it, really understand, you know, there was purpose and there's a reason why, you know, I was asked yeah. to do these things and asked to do certain things. I'll be in the backyard with my stepbrother, Steve, and we out there cutting the grass. He, he's mowing, and I'm using the edges, and I'm edging, edging things up. 
But really, you also got to remember, you know, I'm from Los Angeles. We were living in Florida at the time, so it's, it's snakes out there. It's lizards <laughs> everywhere. And I'm over here. I'm with the, the edger. I'm just looking around, trying to make sure that I'm not stepping on a snake, stepping on a gator. I'm not getting bit up or nothing out there. So I was more just paranoid and scared for my life. Nah, but uh, <laughs> but it, there's a lot of things that, that I learned throughout that time that even today, like, you know, I understand – as I got older, I started to really appreciate and understand why it was that my dad did things the way that he did, and um, and I grew to appreciate it. You know, at the time, as I'm young and I'm I'm thinking my mind was so different at the time. I'm like, man, I can't stand it. You know, my dad asked me to do this, I don't want to do it. My dad asked me to do that, I don't want to do it. But as I got older, I really grew to appreciate and understand the why behind all of it. So, mm. yeah. hey, yeah, yeah. Archie, can I add to this here? Um, sure. Chandler is a big eater. His his appetite is way <laughs> surpassed mine. And uh, so Minerva used to make these beef patties. And uh, so anytime I was coaching, I mean, I'm the last one eating because I'm getting in late. And he would take my portion, <laughs> either put it in the dry or eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you, you knew he didn't want it, right, Chandler? <laughs> hey, look, I knew he was trying to watch his figures, so I said, let me go ahead and help him out. I go ahead and, and, and Ch- Chandler's grandmother made it, made the baked the best pound cake I ever ate, Karcher. And so yeah. she passed that recipe to Minerva, and Minerva started making it. And uh, Chandler would eat up all the cake. <laughs> 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 Look, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you all this it's funny because as I got older I started to realize like man I was like me and my dad are so like in so many ways right like I mean I found myself to be a creature of habit like I'll go to certain places I order the same thing every time I go there because that's what I love that's what I love there's a few things I've never make every time I'm coming coming home I'm never I need you to make these I need you to make these <laughs> I need you to make this Man, and I just be, I just remember I'd be eating them out of house at home every single time. Every single time. But the, it wouldn't go nowhere. I say, I'm a slim, skinny little sucker. And it, I stayed like that the whole time. And I'm trying to put on weight for football. I couldn't put on nothing, but I was eating up everything. So, well, well I was the same way. Um, how old are you now, Chandler? Uh, 32. 32. Okay. So, so when I hit 28, I started to get that dad bod. So, that, that staying skinny and all that stuff, that, that, uh, that's not the same for me anymore, but it doesn't seem like you have that problem, huh? Yeah, oh, man. I'm, I'm trying to run from it. I've been working out still to this day. <laughs> I, I, I say this, Austin, just uh, going back and, and watching you develop and grow, especially in Virginia. Uh, the one thing I always admired about you, you was a hard worker and you was listener. You was a good listener and uh, you took everything to heart everything to heart so i'm glad to see that uh you followed in your dad footsteps as far as coaching is concerned uh but it's really a throwback to what we have done over the years and now we look forward and hear our sons doing the same thing Mm. so god bless you on that well no doubt i i definitely you know take a lot from what i've watched my dad the good things and the bad things and i'm you know um, you know, I'm definitely got a lot, I'm built a lot like him, you know, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I've done and am doing. And, you know, I, I definitely, uh, watched you as a coach and watched my dad and, you know, in a lot of ways I view myself very old school because of coaches like my dad and you. Wow. So, wow. you know, it's, uh, as we said before we got on the air guys, this is really why we're doing it. You know, there's so many people out there that have a wonderful story that's never been told. And uh, it just, you know, as Austin and I would talk after him after school each day and he was driving home, we said, let's just do this on air. Let's be transparent and and vulnerable and let other people share their story. Cause here's the beauty. We don't know who's ever going to listen to this, but one person that it can bless or encourage or help. And it was worth it. So Mike, how did, how did you balance in your coaching career, marriage, raising a family, both currently and even today? Well, I would say back in the NFL Europe days, uh, I thought it was pretty great because uh, Minerva and I made a decision with the uh, girls. Um, 
are they going to homeschool uh, and stay in the States or are they going to homeschool and go to Europe? And so we decided to go to Europe and that means she had to quit our job and um, be the teacher to those girls. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I thought the whole time that they came over, uh, they learned a lot about Europe, uh, not just from the the German lessons that they had to take, but just the, wherever they traveled to, uh, trains and all that good stuff. So it was an opening uh, eye experience for them, as well as Chandler, uh, because I stayed over one year in Europe for the whole year and coached the Bundesliga team, or German football league. And uh, Chandler stayed the whole summer over there, so it was exciting for him just as it was for me. And, uh, and I'm quite sure he'll look back on those days and uh, say, wow. Uh, you know, and who knows? He might be one of those guys to go back and coach now. So mm -hmm. just never know what's in line down the future for Austin or Chandler in this case. So it is, it's just wonderful. But, you know, dealing with family part of it, um, I just recall the first year I was over there with, with you in Dusseldorf, you had your whole family over there, and they had a ball. Um, yeah. And I, I just thought that uh, when it was chance, when I had the chance with uh, Minerva and the girls, uh, that was a part of that plan because I've already seen it from you guys. So, um what a better way to do that. And that's what we did. So is it tough? Yeah, because now, you know, they're over for four months. Now you're going back and it's just a different ball game because now when you come back, now you got to get back in the routine of what you do every day. It's, it's something they'll never forget though, Mike. You're, you're exactly right. Yeah. Well, guys, let's jump to the end of this fourth quarter. Now we've got a few overtime questions, and we'll get you get you on your way. But uh, this is for both of you again. From your perspective, where you both sit, how would you encourage our listeners who are maybe going through a divorce, Mike, mm -hmm. or, you know, you're um, blending a family, Chandler. You've got brothers and sisters that are from another home. How would you encourage our listeners from your story to theirs? Uh, the first thing I would say, don't get a divorce. Uh, seek counseling if you can first. Uh, that forth, uh, you have an opportunity to break down the barriers of uh, the hatred uh, in some cases, the misunderstanding in some cases. And so it gives you an opportunity to step back and hear it from another point of view. I think that's the first thing that uh, I would do if I had to do it again. Uh, but the, the biggest thing I would say in, in, in that case, and it's no different uh, when, you, when you put it in football terms, uh, we only huddle to come back and get information, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, therefore, if I always say uh, to young people now that married, do you huddle? Because that's where the information starts at. And uh, it's no different. Uh, we get the information for alignment, for assignment, and you just think about it in marriage, you need that. You need alignment and assignment. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the biggest things I would say to them. Great words. Yeah. Chandler, what about you? Yeah, I, I mean, for, for me, I, I think I was young at the time, so figuring it out and just understanding uh, – for me now, there was my whole world was being opened up a little bit more, right? Uh, I went from no longer being the only child and no longer seeing life that way to now having uh, siblings that are, you know, I'm not meeting them at uh, at birth and seeing them, you know, come up. I'm meeting them at where they're at. So uh, I got a chance to just really dive right into it and just love on my family, just like, um, just like. You know, I had known them my whole life. And one thing that was that was great is just coming into to meeting Minerva, meeting the rest of my step siblings, like and they were all just open arms. Like family was just immediate. And I think I've always longed for having a sibling, um, and, and wanted to have, you know, uh I, I know for me I always used to joke about about it and say, I wish I had another brother that played football with me so that he could be on the other side and I could be on the other side and we could play. But I mean I I was able to have 
my stepsisters and we would go play basketball all the time and they were basketball was their thing at the time and I would just go play with them because I enjoyed just being out and playing but me and Steven my stepbrother we would go out in the neighborhood and just play nonstop. and I think um, for me like I really longed for that community and really enjoyed enjoyed that so just finding something that you enjoy with them and just really embracing that um, and, and and cherishing those things so Later. Thank you, Chandler. Thank you very much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Well, as we go into overtime and finish up today, guys, um, we want to talk legacy. So this is a question for both of you. Either one can answer first. But uh, how have your successes, like, for instance, those championships or the setbacks or maybe some people call them failures, how have those in your life helped you grow as a father, a man, and even a coach over the years? Well, I, I, I'll start out by saying this, Karcher, and using football terms, again, because I think football has a, a way of dealing with life as well, adversity part of it. Uh, but when you talk about championships, winning is hard. And, and I think every day that we get up and we're able to do what we like doing, uh, you should have passion about it. And uh, for me, uh, when you look at that part of it, the success part of it, um, I, don't, I, I know I don't get too high when we win it and I don't get low, too low when we lose it. Uh, but the thing that I always say in that, in that part of it is, how are you living from day to day? Because your lifestyle helps you through the rough parts of it. Uh, but football does have some substance to, to, to bring you through it. But uh, I think more than anything, uh, the Lord has been good to me. And so, therefore, I must in turn be good to others. So if I can ever keep that in the, in the front of me of being good to others because knowing who's been good to me, then I think I – I think I'm being successful. Well said. How about you, Chandler? All right. I can, can you run it, right, run it by me one more time? I'll listen to my yeah, dad. How, 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 how have your successes, like the championships, or what I would call setbacks, some people might call them failures, how have those situations helped you grow as a man and a coach over the years? Oh, yeah. I think uh, one thing that, for me, it just – gave me another opportunity to kind of like reset well I'll, I'll speak to like having different setbacks like it gave me a chance to kind of reset and refocus a little bit and see what it where i might have made mistakes where i might have gone wrong um and try to like channel that back in a positive way okay now moving forward one i don't want to make those same mistakes again but also i want to go ahead and make this a better uh better process and just and just trying to constantly work towards um, just being better. Um, I think, you know, early on as a coach, I was a little younger. I was coming straight out of, in, you know, younger as a coach, I should say. And I was coming straight from playing. So um, kind of changing my perspective a little bit from the player side of it to now being a coach. So I had to kind of like, in a way, uh, like mature a lot, a lot faster and just like understand in coaching, all right, this is what I want to do. So there are certain things that now I need to change. There's certain things I need to do differently. Uh, so I, I think, you know, every time I had a setback, that's what it allowed me to do was kind of refocus and recenter on what it is I needed to do to be successful. Um, and then, you know, I, I was able to have some, some success as a coach this last season, ha winning a great cup championship. Um, and I think just kind of understanding the things that I, we did well and the things that I felt like were successful, just kind of honing back in on those things and, you know, trying to just make them better. At the end of the day, I'm constantly striving to try to, you know, make this process better, make, you know, the information I'm getting to the players as clean as it can be and as good as it can be. Uh, so I'm always just trying to find different ways to do that and be successful. Um, so that's kind of how that goes for me. Yeah, so thank thank you. Back, Carter, um, and sure. I just remember during the season for Chandler, um, I think they lost four or five games in a row, if I'm not mistaken. And he said, man, what we got to do? And obviously I had my answers, but they was wasn't good enough. <laughs> but uh, I said, you got to hang in there. You got to go back to the fundamentals. 
how did you get to those games before losing those four games? And I said, all those things are variables and how you start from point A to B again. So uh, it's just amazing he talks about those things. But uh, those are the things that you go back to. And, and, and Karcher, you know, uh, if you lost, you got to go back to the start or the beginning of it and figure out what it is that you didn't do well uh, and, and, and kind of hammer those things in the next week of practice. So I think – the same thing happens in life when something um, failures you may have or whatever it may be, where do I go? And uh, that's first going back to the knees and praying and, and getting confirmation. So um, that's good stuff. You know, Mike, you talked about going back to the beginning and we, Austin's going to smile when I said that because we always on this podcast and in our life we talk about going to the beginning where everything started and the one who created us in his image and likeness and said that we are very good and that we are his children and beloved and you go back to that foundation like you said or fundamental in football you got a chance to get it right again so uh, that's that's good stuff guys jonesy what would you say has been the most significant moment in your spiritual journey I would have to say, uh, Karchi, even at that point when I I accepted Christ in, in my life, um, not full-heartedly understanding it, but uh, over the years, yes, now understanding why. Uh, but I would have to say that was probably the, the biggest one. And in and, and, and different stages of my life as well, high school, college, professional, well, those are years that you are maturing in the Christian walk, hopefully. And uh, are you going to have some setbacks? Sure you are. Uh, but it's continuing moving forward in, in, in each stage of your life with it. So I, I think that's probably the biggest one, Karcher. Thanks, Mike. Chandler, what uh, what has been the most significant thing you've learned from watching your dad grow in his faith and its effect on you? And maybe what was your most significant, um, you know, uh, moment in your life that, um, uh, in your spiritual journey? Yeah, uh, I would say just kind of with my dad, just seeing how my dad operated. I mean, we walk in and my dad would be reading the Bible, reading the book, and just kind of just like seeing him being so laser focused and so uh, detailed in that. My dad's a note taker. He's in there with got his pen highlighting things and just doing all that. So kind of like seeing, seeing that uh, just kind of, I think for me, you know, when things would get hard for me, I always felt like I would come back to that. Uh, whenever, whenever things got hard, I would, you know, that's when I would find my way to get back into the word and really just like studying it and just trying to understand at the, end of the, at the end of the day, like, how how is it trying to speak to me? And, like, how is it going to move me uh, to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do uh, to, to, you know, ha be successful in life, um, in my faith, in just different different ways. So uh, I think being able to, to see my dad and go through his process and see that um, helps me when I'm down and I feel like I'm kind of going through different things and going through different moments in life. Uh, it, that, that's just when it really charges me is, like, all right, I need to get back into it and I kind of refocus and get back into the, into the word and kind of that kind of helps lead me back to where I need to be. So um, that's kind of, I would say is my, you know, I think you said the, your, my biggest success in it um, as yeah. well as uh, just kind of seeing my dad kind of go through it. That's how I, it's always been for me. So. Awesome. Thank you, Chandler. Mm -hmm. Okay. These last three questions are to both of you pretty quick answer type things. Uh, we'll start with you, Mike, on this as we get ready to close the, the time out. But uh, you and Chandler both f give us five words that describe your spiritual journey, Mike. Five words. Uh, the first one, I would have to say joy. Uh, the second one, I would have to say uh, would be the light. The light that uh, he gives me every day to see him, but more important to see myself. Uh, the next one I would have to say uh, is love. 
without a question because uh, if I don't love myself, how can I love others? Uh, Amen. But then the next one I would have to say is the family uh, because um, without family, I think us as men on this earth, uh, we don't have anybody to share it with. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it. And the last one is being faithful. Great, Thank you. great, great. Thank you. Chandler, five words to describe your spiritual journey. Yep. Uh, I say, for me, I'm going to round them off quick and then I'll come back around to them. So, <laughs> uh, love, discipline, faith, um, family, and then last, I would say, I'll, I'll come back to the last one, but I, I think for me, for sure, when it comes to love, family, I think that's where it all it all comes back to. It's all centered in that for me. Um, my family is a big part of, of my life, a big part of my purpose, um, and I think when it comes down to it, I think all my upbringing with my with my dad, everything that he's taught me with the word and everything, like it all kind of is all cir circled around that. Like it all comes back to it. Um, and I think my love that I have for my family, the passion I have for everything is a result of all of that. I don't think none of that would be possible if it wouldn't have been for my dad and the things that he's taught me um, in, in that regard. Um, I think discipline at the end of the day for me, I know what I need to do to, to you know, be successful. But when it comes to faith, when I, when I need to really hunker down and refocus and, and kind of get recentered, it comes back to that um, and just getting back to being disciplined in what it is that I do. Uh, so, yeah, that, that fifth one, I'm still trying to think what, what comes to mind uh, right, right away. But well, I, the, the number, the number is not magical, but uh, we, we appreciate you sharing those. Mm -hmm. Here's the next one, guys. When someone spends time with you individually, I'm speaking, when someone spends time with you, how would you want to be remembered when they'd walk away? Um, I, it, that relates to me, Karcher, and the, and the kids that I have, and also the players that I coach. And so when I look at that, I try to coach young men like I'm coaching my son. Uh, I know we're not all perfect, uh, but uh, if you're coaching your son, I don't see you cursing him out. Uh, if you're coaching your son, I see you coaching with love. So uh, those things to me uh, play a big role in where I coach the young men I coach in this day and time. Uh, but truly, um, when you look at it, you want them to see you as a, as a person that they really trusted. And, uh, and I use that example because... Uh, just this past season, I had a young man and I suspended him from playing the wide receiver position on the Stallions team because he told a tale. And I said, I can, I can go with you out on that limb if you tell me the truth. But if you tell me something different than the truth, I can't go out on that limb with you. And, um, uh, I suspended him for three games and, you know, talking to Coach Skip about it. But uh, that young man right today is in the NFL, and he gives me a call at least once a month saying thank you every time. So I think that part of it pays off, uh, not for somebody to send you money, not for somebody to, to uh, send you gifts, but just to say thanks for what you've done for me. Awesome. Awesome. Chandler, you, someone spends time with you, they walk away. How do you want to be remembered? I, I want, for me, I think uh, a big part of it is comfort. I think uh, when I am having conversations with people, uh, especially, you know, guys that I'm coaching, I want them to be able to feel like it's a safe space uh, that we can have those tough conversations and talk about whatever it is that they need to talk about. If they need to unload something or if they just want to talk, talk life, talk ball, um, I want it to be a, just a comfortable place because at the end of the day, I think if I can get someone to be able to have that, 
that feeling when they walk away from me, uh, I'm doing my part because I think at the end of the day, I can only I I I, I can only touch them so much as a, as a with X's and O's, but I think life is is going to be so much more important. I still talk to some of the guys that I coached when I was in Idaho, and they still will call me and just check in on me and different things like that. And I, you know, one of them was ha- having a camp in uh, in California and being able to go pull up and see see the camp that he's hosting with young kids now. Like that's something that you know brings joy to me and makes me happy because at the end of the day, um, I was able to have you know a, a moment with him outside of just it being just football related. Like I was able to go and watch him coach coach high school football and sit with his family and hang out with them. So I think being able to have you know that comfort and have a, a safe space for guys. Um, is, is where I want things to be left when I walk away from them. So, Thank you, Chandler. You know, most of my career, Miss Pauline, when I'd leave the house in the morning, she would remind me of something very simple but yet very profound. She would say, don't ever forget that coaching is a high calling. Mm. And I think that's what, you know, all of us are saying when we share our stories, that it's much, much bigger than just the scoreboard, the rings, All those things are fun. They're much more fun than losing. But at the end of the day, just as we sit here today, it was 1987 when Mike and I's relationship started. I don't think we've ever sat down and said, hey, what about that ring or what about that score against that team? But for almost, you know, for almost 40 years, we've stayed together because of the people and what matters most. So here's the last thing, and it's for you too. It's a little bit of a treat. As we get ready to close, and I'll do that in a moment, called Final Words Between a Father and a Son. Mike, anything you want to say to Chandler or Chandler, anything you want to say to your dad? One's in Florida, one's in California. I always call him and say I love him. That's that's the one thing he's going to always hear from me, uh, and I hear from him. So uh, that's nothing new on the sun. It's just that's that's who we are. And uh, I just think that uh, if we keep living, keep sharing, and keep giving to one another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Chandler. I, I uh, uh, right, like my dad hit on the head. I love him. Uh, that's that's always going to be, you know, something that we tell each other. But I think I, one thing I, for me, as I've gotten older and as I'm getting older, I see, you know, when I was young, my mom would always say, like, your mannerisms are such, such like your dad. Like, I do certain things, and she's like, that's your dad right there. And I, you know, when I'm young, I'm like, I don't know what you talking about. I don't know. I don't know. But then as I get older, the more I do things. Um, the, the more that I find joy in certain things, a lot of it I'm realizing that a lot of it comes back to my dad. Like my, when I was young, me and my dad would go, I'll go golf with my dad and I'd run out there. Like my dad was telling a story earlier, I'm chasing after the golf ball and going to go hit and do all that. And I enjoy driving the carts. Um, <laughs> and I, and I, I see myself now, like I, I find so much joy and passion when I go golf. And I, I think it, it brings me back to a place when I was young, just being around my dad and being with him. Um, so I, that's one thing that, you know, I, as I get older, I see so many different things that I do and I'm like, Hey, there go. I'm just like my daddy. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so I, that's, that's it right there. Austin, do you have any final words for our guests or, uh, for Mike and Chandler before I close us out? No, I just want to say thank you for, um, taking the time and just being transparent and, uh, sharing y'all's story. Um, I know. Um, each of y'all have played a role in my life and, um, I'm thankful for who y'all are and, uh, who you represent. And, you know, I, I look up to both y'all and, uh, and I'm just grateful for y'all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know, I know our listeners have been blessed and, uh, it's been a great hour and 45 minutes. Wow. But I know Mike's getting ready to head off to camp and start a new season. Chandler's getting a little break from that championship run in Montreal, and he'll kick it back off in the summertime. But I just want to challenge our listeners that as they walk along the way today, remember the most important person is always the one in front of you. And as we are about our way, don't ever forget, let's awaken kingdom culture.